This is part two of gyroscopic precession. We ended part one talking about how a bicycle wheel having the same diameter, same radius as a car wheel and turning the same number of revolutions per minute or revolutions per second or radians per second, anyway the same angular velocity, the car wheel will still have a lot more angular momentum because it has so much more mass and let's say we're comparing a lawnmower wheel to a bicycle wheel. Let's say this lawnmower wheel has the same mass as the bicycle wheel, but the bicycle wheel has a much greater diameter than the lawnmower wheel. Well, then the bicycle wheel will have more angular momentum, even if they're both turn the same angular velocity and have the same mass. So, mass, the more mass you have, the more angular momentum you have, the more the mass, the distance between the axis of rotation and where the mass is, the more angular momentum you have. Okay, here's a merry-go-round and it has a lot of mass. Merry-go-rounds are heavy, especially with people on them. And the distance that all this mass is from the axis of rotation here in the center is a good distance, a lot more than the distance between the axis of a car wheel and the tread. So you get this much mass with this much distance from the axis of rotation spinning fast, you're going to have a lot of angular momentum. So if this merry-go-round spin around real fast and you walk up here and bump into it, well, it has a lot of angular momentum and it's going to keep going. And you're going to start going the same direction that it's going. Okay, now, let's say we have something spinning around our finger here. Here's a little lightweight plastic button, heart shaped. So I spin around my finger and you notice it speeds up as the string gets shorter. And here's an object a little heavier. This is a knob from a cabinet, left one that's left over. So let's spin it around and it kind of pushes my finger around a little more and bangs it a little harder. Oops, did I get that on camera? There we go. This showbiz is kind of tricky, ain't it? There we go. In summary, the angular, angular momentum of a rotating body is determined by three different things. One is the amount of mass of the rotating body. Two is the distance of that mass from the axis that the rotating body is rotating around and the third factor is the speed that, that mass is going round and round. Those three factors determine your angular momentum. Now let's talk about the stresses in a propeller shaft. But before we do that let's refresh our memories and talk about the difference between torque on a shaft and bending moment on a shaft. Let's say we take this propeller shaft and let's say it's a long propeller shaft. Okay. And let's say we make a teeter-totter out of it. And there's the fulcrum and there's one guy sitting up here and there's another guy sitting over here. Well, obviously the top of this shaft right here is in tension and the bottom over here is in compression. There's a bending moment here. This is where the greatest bending moment is. It's equal to his weight times that distance which equals his weight times that distance if it's balanced. Okay, let's say these guys get off the teeter-totter and they decide to twist it around. Let's say this guy wants to turn it around clockwise from his point of view looking at it like that. But this guy wants to turn around what he considers clockwise from his point of view. Well, then you've got a shearing stress that exists all along this shaft. This dot right here next to this dot right here. Well, this dot is trying to go this way and this dot is trying to go this way. So they're trying to shear apart. A while ago when they were sitting on the shaft, this dot was trying to go that way and this dot was trying to go that way. So as you can see, a propeller shaft, which is being driven by an engine, is subjected to the shear stress 
like what exists when these two guys are trying to turn their shaft. Okay, and it's also subjected to a bending moment because of the gyroscopic torque. We don't want to confuse gyroscopic torque with torque on the shaft. Remember our bicycle wheel hanging, there's the axle sticking out and we had a rope hanging from a rafter on the back porch. Well, pulling up on this axle put a gyroscopic torque on this rotating body, which was our bicycle wheel. It made the top of that axle in compression, just like the top of that one would be in compression if these guys were lifting up on both ends and we had a weight sitting in the middle. That gyroscopic torque made the bottom of this bicycle axle in tension. A helicopter rotor is free to swing it has little hinges right here where this rotor can come up or down. That's why it freely swings higher when it's back here in the back, when it's getting the greatest angle of attack that we were talking about earlier, when it's on the east side and it swings high in the back, and then swings average over to the west and then low toward the north. That's because we have hinges on these rotors, but an airplane propeller obviously does not have that. When this propeller wants to go that way forward and that way back or that way back and this way forward or whatever, it's not hinged on that propeller shaft. It's rigidly attached to it, which means there's a bending moment on that shaft caused by the gyroscopic precession. When an airplane pitches up or down or yaws right or left, the engine bearings on the crankshaft, well, you can't see the engine, it's under that cowling, but the bearings in there, which go all around that little shaft from the propeller to there, those bearings, they change the axis of the shaft Okay, and for all practical purposes, that crankshaft can be considered the propeller shaft. I guess propeller shaft be bolted onto the crankshaft, but they're all one big shaft in line connecting the, the engine to the propeller. Okay, this results in gyroscopic torque on the rotating propeller. The propeller shaft is torqued because the engine is driving the propeller. Because that resulting in shear all around there but the bending moment in the shaft caused by the shaft's bearings as we change the axis we have a bending moment because just like the bending moment that was in this shaft because of the rope holding it up okay the bending moment in that shaft caused by the shaft's bearings changes the axis of the shaft it applies gyroscopic torque to the spinning propeller. It's changing the plane of the spinning propeller. It's changing like that or that or whatever. Now that we know how an airplane acts when we yank it all around, let's do some math to see if it'll stay in one piece. Specifically, to see if the propeller shaft will stay in one piece or if it's going to let the propeller go flying off by itself. In our structural design section of this course, we studied area moment of inertia. Remember how we looked at a 2 by 4 cross section, we looked at a round cross section. This could be a pencil or a log or a toothpick. Okay, this could be any kind of square piece of wood or steel or whatever. Okay, the area moment of inertia, we just called it moment of inertia back then. It was equal to the sum of all the little areas. Okay, here's our little incremental amount of moment of inertia. It's equal to an incremental amount of area times the square of the distance between that area and the centroid. The centroid is the line where you have no stress right across the middle. 
if we're bending these things here, if this is a teeter-totter board or something. Okay, a rotating body has a mass moment of inertia. Remember, the mo our area moment of inertia was area times the square of distance. Our mass moment of inertia is a little increment of mass times the square of its distance to the rotating axis. Okay, so the, the these two different types of moment of inertia are similar in a way. They're equal to something times the square of distance. The one's area times square of distance. The other is mass times the square of distance. So, and depending on the shape of your area, that determines what your moment of inertia will be. That's what the moment of inertia is for a round cross section, pi over 64 times the diameter to the fourth power. Here's what the moment of inertia is for a rectangular cross section, base times the depth cubed over 12. And that's going to be in units of inches to the fourth, or centimeters to the fourth, or meters to the fourth. But our mass moment of inertia is going to be in units of kilograms times meters squared, or inches squared, or centimeters squared, because our little increment of mass is going to be in grams or kilograms, and the square of our distance to the rotating axis will be in something like meters squared. So if a ring is spinning on its axis, here's a ring, and the thickness of the ring, the outside, well, before we get to that, let's just look at the two equations. Notice the, here's a disk, here's a ring. The moment of inertia of the ring is mass times the square of the distance from of the radius. But the disk, it's only half that much because it has a lot of mass starting at the center of it going out. All the mass of the ring is out here at the ring. So if you have a ring that has the same diameter as this disk and has the same mass as this disk, in other words, it's going to be a lot more dense because this ring is thin, this disk is all the way from there to there. But if they have the same mass, then this ring will have twice the moment of inertia that this disk will have. The disk moment of inertia is equal to the ring's moment, moment of inertia over 2. We don't have enough time in this lesson, but in part 3 of gyroscopic precession, we'll use calculus to derive these two formulas.